Well, good morning. Take your seats, and we are going to open our Bibles once again to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to continue our study this morning on the topic of spiritual warfare. We're going to be talking about a particular piece of armor that we are to be wearing, and uh, we're going to focus on that this morning. But again, Ephesians chapter 6 has been our focal passage, will continue to be this morning as we begin reading in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up, put on the, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I, I do not want to mislead you through this study. This text begins by telling you, be strong in the Lord. This is not about your strength or mine. This is not about our abilities. This is not about learning how to box with the devil. This is about you learning how to stand strong in the evil day in which we are living, how to put on the whole armor of God, not just pieces and parts, but how to stand and how to be obedient in that standing. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you could extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And now, if you'll pray with me once again, please. And Father, this morning, that is my prayer as well, that you will give me boldness to proclaim the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly. Lord, that you will open my mouth to speak your truth and open our hearts to hear it, receive it, and to act on it. Uh, Lord, guide us by your spirit in this process today. And may we all come under the power and the submission of our own lives to the word of God as we hear it today. In Jesus' name we ask this, and God's people said, amen. Jay Rathman was deer hunting in Northern California uh, near the Red Bluff area. He climbed over a ledge, or was climbing up kind of a rocky hill, climbed over a ledge, and as he got to the top of the ledge, sensed a movement off to his right. And before he could do anything else, a four-foot-long rattlesnake that had been coiled there lunged at him. Now, it barely missed his face, got its fangs tangled up in his turtleneck sweater that he was wearing, and, uh, and then it, was, it, was, it came at him with such force from the right, got its fangs hung, and then its whole body just wrapped around his shoulder and his neck. Now, if you don't like snakes, you might want to put your fingers in your ears for these next few moments. This thing, he, he didn't know what else to do, so he just, just grabbed it by the neck. And he said I could, he could feel the venom, he feel the warm venom just running through its neck as it was preparing to bite him. So his fangs were like darning needles in his sweater, and the, he said, you don't understand how loud a rattlesnake's rattlers are until it's trying to kill you. And he said it was incredibly loud. 
he lost his balance, slid backwards, head first, down the slope, his, his rifle and binoculars bouncing along beside him as he went. And he said, fortunately, I, I got stuck between some rocks and, and, and I was upside down, hanging down, uh, but at least I had stopped sliding, but the snake was still there. And then he got his right hand on his rifle, pried the teeth, tried, pried the fangs out of his turtleneck sweater, uh, got the thing disengaged. And it, in, the, in the meantime, it had struck at him like eight times and was hitting him under his eyes. It was just shooting at his face, trying to get a bite on him. And he said, finally, all the only thing I could do, he said, I learned in that moment that he said, did you know snakes don't blink? <laughs> now, that's how close this battle was. And he had his left hand around its neck, and he said, I had no choice but to just begin to squeeze. He said, I, I ultimately had to choke it to death before he would let me go because he said I was passing out. He said I was hanging upside down. The blood was rushing to my head. And he said, when I finally tried to toss the dead snake aside, I couldn't get it out of my hand. I couldn't unpry my fingers from around its neck. Now, I hope you've never had an encounter like that with a snake. That, that, I mean, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty rugged story, um, and uh, it, it's certainly not something that if you're squeamish about snakes that you want to think about. But you are in a war with a serpent. It's happening. You're, you're in the war. I'm not saying this is something that's going to happen to you. This is something that is happening. And our foe is much more deadly than a snake. And the stakes of losing to him are much higher. If you are born onto planet Earth, you are born into warfare. You don't have to pick a fight. The fight is coming to you. The, uh, you don't have to go into the wilderness to find it. It's like Amazon. It delivers to your door. We're in a war, and this is not one involving guns and bombs or even one that's political in nature. We are in a spiritual war that affects every aspect of our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual life. And we've already said this several times already, the things that happen in the unseen spiritual realm have outcomes that play out in our physical lives and our relationships. The solutions that we need are not physical solutions. The root of the issue for many of our problems is a spiritual problem. And many of us are in a mess today because we're trying to solve spiritual problems with physical solutions and physical weapons and methodologies. Paul tells us that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places in Ephesians chapter 1. He tells us in Colossians that we are to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He tells us these things because that's where our strength and our blessings come from. It's also ground zero of the warfare. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, with physical enemies and adversaries. Our true enemy is invisible to our eyes and our physical senses, but he is a very, very real enemy. And he's a very personal enemy. And, and this, you know, Satan is not just the representation of the spirit of evil, like we sometimes talk about Christmas spirit or Mother Nature. It's not that kind of impersonal spirit that we're talking about today. Satan is personal, he's strategic, He's focused on destroying the works of God, and you are the target. You are the target. Your marriage is the target. Your children are the target. Your mind is the target. This church is the target. He unleashes his minions, his demonic forces to torment and oppress and frustrate the people of God and to wreak havoc and chaos on the earth. Jesus said that Satan has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. He is more real than anything that we can see with our physical eyes or touch with our hands. He is not the mythological personification of wickedness. He's not a little elf running around in a red suit and a horns and a pitchfork. That's what he wants you to think he is because you will dismiss him if that's what you think he is. That's part of the strategy is to darken the eyes of the unbeliever, but praise God, he's a defeated enemy. 
He's a bulldog on a chain, and God holds the chain. Satan is not equal with God. There's no equal standing here. God created Satan as an angel. He was created just as you were created and I was created, but he is a fallen angel, and, and as such, he is not powerless, and we have to be very, very careful in how we deal with the enemy. So we're engaged in this spiritual warfare with our adversary, the devil, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies, and tragically, more people today than ever doubt his reality. I know. I can feel it in this room. There are people going, this is kind of nutty. I I mean, this kind of stuff, really? Do we still believe that? I mean, do we really talk about that kind of stuff? You know, I thought we were kind of a, you know, like a 21st century church. I mean, this stuff is what they were dealing with back in the ancient days, you know, when people weren't smart. We're smart now. We got the internet. You know, we, we know everything now. Why are we dealing with this? I'm telling you, there are people looking at me thinking that today. I know that. You know why I know that? Because I used to be one of you. I would hear this kind of stuff, and I'd go, okay, well, I don't have to worry about that. I mean, really, come on. The devil? Spiritual warfare? The enemy? We, We really believe that stuff today? You know, as a believer, listen, you have to make a very clear and and defining decision in your life, a commitment, if you would. You have to decide if you're going to believe the interpretation of reality as it is set forth in this book You're going to say, okay, what what this book says, some of this I don't get, some of this I'm not sure I understand, some of this seems a little antiquated to me, but do you believe what the book says about reality? And if you don't, you believe what the world says. The world says there's no such thing as supernatural beings, including God. I'm sorry, but if you're a smart person today, you just don't believe that stuff. You can't really interact with the world today and believe that those kind of things are still happening. But you've got to decide, which reality am I going to accept? Which reality am I going to live by? Which reality am I going to teach my children about? Which reality am I going to make sure they understand so that they understand reality correctly? Is there a real enemy out there? Do you believe there's a warfare happening? Now, again, I'm just, folks, I read crowds. I'm realistic. I know that many of you don't. I know when people just look at me and say, well, poor old man, you know, he's just kind of getting senile on us now, talking about the devil, and, you know, let's be polite, not walk out on him. But come on, there are people that just don't get it. There are people that do not believe this is true. You see, we believe this book defines reality. We believe the Bible, the Word of God, defines reality. This is real reality. The Bible says in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 that the Bible is not cleverly devised myths. These are not stories made up by men. It's truth without any mixture of error. It's absolute truth. It tells us to watch out and be on our guard because there's an adversary, the devil, who is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, you can believe that there's a lion out there or not, but that doesn't change the fact that there's a lion out there. And we're either going to be aware that the lion is out there or we're going to just go through life and pretend that that's not an issue and we find ourselves torn up and we don't know why. There's a lion out there. Well, I don't believe that. Well, that doesn't change the fact that he's trying to destroy you. And so we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and rulers and darkness. Well, where are they? You can't see them. We're at war. And and if we're not armed and prepared for that warfare, we're going to be victimized and destroyed by it. Now, we've discussed the first Three pieces of this armor already. These pieces, the the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet 
prepared with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We've already talked about those three pieces. And those three pieces you're supposed to have on at all times. You're supposed to keep those on. You sleep in those. You keep those on all the time. There's, there's no time that you are to be taking those off. We need, we need those three pieces. But, but the pieces now that we move to the next level of armor, these are pieces that we are to take up as we need them. They're provided for us but we take them up when the battles come. These are, this is when you are face to face with the serpent, okay? You're eyeball to eyeball with the snake that doesn't blink. And these are the times that you need to take up these pieces of the armory. One writer suggested that these are like the baseball player's uniform. You know, you, a baseball player comes onto the field in a uniform supplied by the team in shoes, cleats probably provided by the team or some sponsor, He has on the foundational stuff that identifies him as a member of the team. But when it comes time to get up to bat, he has to take up a bat. He has to put on a batting helmet. You see what I'm saying? You, if you're playing outfield, you have to put in, put on your glove. These are things that you don't wear these all the time. They don't walk, you don't walk around with your bat everywhere you go. You take the bat up when it's your turn to bat, right? Right? You put the helmet on when they're getting ready to throw, you know, 95 or 100 mile an hour balls at you. Then I need a helmet on. But you don't always need that. You take those up when it's time to take them up. The, the Roman soldiers that Paul models this whole picture on had a shield that they actually had two shields. One's a, a little small round shield. That's not the one we're talking about. There was another shield that he's talking about here that was the size of a door. It was about four or four and a half feet tall. Uh, it, it had metal at the top and the bottom. And, and it, was, it was made of wood, but the wood also was lined with, with an animal skin and, and sometimes another piece of metal under that. It was designed to do one thing. It was designed to keep the soldiers safe from incoming fiery arrows. It was designed to extinguish flaming arrows that were shot at them. Now, Peter tells us not to be surprised at the fiery trials that are coming your way. They're coming. Some of you are already on fire today. All right. You're already on fire. Your life is burning down. You don't even know why it's burning down, but it's burning down. Well, what's happening? Well, the enemy is shooting fiery arrows into your life and you're not extinguishing the flame. You're letting it burn down everything around you. Let me tell you some things that the enemy targets. First of all, the enemy targets your faith. These arrows that come into your life target your faith. The Bible tells us that our battles will take place on three fronts, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three things that we're gonna confront. The world represents the sociological and cultural realities happening around us. You have to live in a culture. You are an incarnated person. You live in a culture. You live in a social strata. You live in a sociological system. And the Bible calls that system the world. We live in the world. And this represents the cultural and sociological battles that we're fighting all the time. The flesh is another enemy. The flesh is your physiological and psychological person. All right, this is where the enemy can get into your mind, into your thinking, uh, can affect your body in some, in some ways. So the flesh is another place that you will find yourself in battle. And finally, there's the devil. We know we've already talked about him. So he represents the supernatural dimension of the battlefront. But this, these are the three areas that we are going to be fighting in at all times. Culturally, physically, psychologically, and supernaturally. All right, you got it? Those are the three battlefronts. And all of our warfare takes place on one of these three places. It, it is here that spiritual strongholds are set up. We'll talk about those next week. It's here the enemy seeks to undermine our faith. Listen, we, we need to learn how to defend each of these fronts in our lives. The Christian's armory includes weapons to fight battles on all these fronts, 
We fight with this weapon of faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, John tells us, even our faith. Secondly, the enemy undermines your convictions. Stay with me. Eve was the first person to experience temptation. The tempter gained access to Eve's mind and heart as the serpent whispered doubts into her thoughts. Did God say that you can't have any of that fruit? Did God really say you can't even touch it? Did God say, did God say? You see, doubt is a fiery arrow. Some of you are dealing today with doubt. Some of you have actually dismissed the Christian faith because you have doubts. You go, well, if I'm doubting, then it must not be real. Doubt is a fiery dart that gets fired into your life and burns a lot of stuff down. It's, it's not always doubting that God exists. It's doubting that God is good. Is God really a good God? If, if bad things are happening in this way, why, you can't, how can we claim God is good? I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. Is God good? That's what we begin to doubt. You know, folks, faith means to have absolute confidence that God will do as he says he will do. Absolute confidence that when God says he is a certain way, when God says he will do a certain thing, he will do that. He is that way. That, that is faith. Faith is having confidence in those things. But temptation comes and the enemy comes to take away that confidence. Who needs the Bible? Written by men, you know, that lived 3,000 years ago. Who cares? Why do we need to do what they say today? Who are they to tell me how to live my life today? They don't even know the issues that I'm dealing with today. How can the Bible speak into my life in any real way today? We doubt the word of God is true. We question what it says about reality and morality and God. This past week, Gallup released a survey that showed engagement with the Bible to be at an all-time low in America. Now, that comes as no surprise since we very seldom receive encouragements, even in church, to read the Bible. Many of us take little tiny droppers of, of the Bible into our lives. You know, every now and then we'll take a little dropper full and then we wonder, why doesn't it really seem to make any difference? Well, are you really engaging with the Bible? Little wonder that the world has no time for it. Even those who say they believe the Bible is the word of God don't spend time reading it. So why would somebody who doesn't believe, you know, who, who thinks it's not even a legitimate document spend time with it, when those of you who believe it don't. Now, I'm not saying y'all, but the people that were surveyed said, we just don't believe it. We're not going to take the time to read it. It doesn't matter. And all of this serves one end, and that is to undermine our convictions. The things that we once believed were right are being questioned today. Kids go off to college. For some of them, for the very first time, people face they're facing convictions and questions. Nobody has ever questioned their convictions before, and now they're on a college campus and everybody is questioning what they believe. Are, they, are your kids prepared for that? You know, there's a lot of wannabe quarterbacks out there that love to get a ball and just run down the field, and when nobody's trying to tackle them, they can hang on to that ball all day long. But you put them out in the field with people trying to tackle them, let them get hit a couple of times. And all of a sudden, that ball gets hard to hold on to. That's, that's what's happening. We're sending our kids off to college. They've never had their convictions questioned before. They've never been hit before by the kinds of things that will come at them. So we need to have the shield of faith. We need, to, we need to, to learn to hold the shield of faith. We need to teach our children how to stand with the shield of faith because the fiery darts will come flying out of nowhere, folks. And if we have not taken this shield up, we won't be able to extinguish those flames. They will burn down our convictions. They will hollow out our faith. These flaming arrows come at us in the form of doubts and fears and questions and temptations. Can I just tell you, folks, listen. We get knocked off balance by life. Circumstances come along. Things happen, blow us over. We get knocked down. And the first thing that we begin to do is we begin to say, well, my faith doesn't matter anymore. We give that up. The one thing that can help you to stand again, 
you give away because you're thinking, well, if it was, if it was really good, it wouldn't have resulted in me getting knocked over here and blown over. So the, the fiery darts of doubts and fears and questions and temptation come into our lives and then they ignite a lot of stuff inside of us. They ignite things that we thought were maybe even dead and now they're back alive again. Folks, listen, we need to stand together. One of the things that the shield that the Romans had was able to do, they had a metal hook on the end of each of the, of the shields and they could literally create a wall, a moving wall that would seal up the cracks between them so they could walk as one unit into the battle. You know, that's what the church is supposed to be about. We, we, hold, our, we hold up our end, we hold our, we hold our shield, and then we connect to the next person and to the next person and to the next person and to the next person. And we stand together with our brothers and sisters. And we're going to stand a far better chance of surviving the enemy's attacks if we're doing that. Well, finally this, the enemy retreats when you resist him. We are to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. James chapter 4 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Faith is acting with your feet. Acting what you believe in your heart, okay? Faith is simply living as though the things that God says in his word are true. What if everything that God says in his book is true? How would that change your life if you believe that? How would that change you as a person? If you believe that everything that is written in this book is absolutely true and will happen exactly as God says, would that change your life any? I think it would straighten a lot of people's lives out. The problem is we don't believe this. We don't believe it. Faith is simply living as though the things that God says and his word are true. One critic of the faith said, faith is just believing what you know ain't so. But that's not faith. Faith is action. Faith is warfare. Faith is wrestling. And if you believe that what God says is true, then tell your feet. We need to stand up. We need to grab our war shield. We need to stand on our feet and resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, and he will flee from you. You'll scare him. He won't scare you. Satan doesn't know what to do with a Christian that stands up and says, you know, I believe this. I stand on this. I believe this is true. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world, the Bible says. Faith is the victory. I... Uh, I've struggled a lot with this series. Let me be honest with you. I've struggled with it. Um, I don't believe we're just randomly in this study. I, I, uh, I entered into a season in my life last January. I remember, I remember the moment that it started. I remember the day, the evening. I remember it because the next morning I woke up with COVID. That helps you remember stuff. So I remember. But the battle began the night before. And the battle was, and, and, and you know, and I know all, all of us struggle to a certain degree with this. I, I get that. And, and I, I always have. Anybody else in here struggle sometimes with fear? A few hands going up, okay. The rest of y'all, good for you. But. <laughs> but I found myself in a season, and I mean by season, I mean this was three or four months, of the most relentless attacks spiritually, emotionally, in my life. And, and I, 
I thought, I, thought I, I can't do this much longer. It, it seemed like everything, it seemed like everything that I was afraid of in my life was beginning to like just stand up and go, okay, well, this is next. I ended up, I ended up in, in a, uh, I laugh now, I didn't laugh that day. I ended up in a doctor's office or a doctor's appointment and they were looking at stuff and they said, yeah, they said, we're probably going to, you know, if this happens, we're probably going to send you over here to radiology and start some radiation treatments. And oh, by the way, this aneurysm you have, that's growing. So we're going to send you to the cardio. I said, so, so you're sitting here telling me that you're going to refer me to an oncologist and a cardiologist on the same day in the same appointment. He said, yep, that's what we're doing. I couldn't believe it. I thought, this is crazy. It wasn't crazy. It was very, very intentional. I know now what the enemy was doing. And I walked out of that office and I thought, well, I'm done. I mean, it's just a matter of which one, who gets my cadaver, you know, when it's over, because I'm done, you know. I, I, I mean, there's, there's no way. And I don't sit around and worry. You know, I'm not... I'm not afraid to die. I'm kind of like Woody Allen. You know, I don't want to be there when it happens, but I, you know, I, I'm not afraid of dying. But I found out I was sure afraid of being sick. I don't mind dying. Just take me out, you know, but I don't want to be sick. And so I walked through this season every night. I was on the edge of my bed, on my knees, weeping, calling out to the Lord. Fortunately, I, I, I would scream sometimes to the Lord. You know why? I didn't feel him. I didn't feel him. All I felt was fear. And I went through this for more than, more than three months. It was just, but you know, but in the middle of this, God was good. God was sending me encouragement. People would just randomly send me stuff on the internet. I'm going, wow, I never, you know. It, 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 was, it was very clear that God was involved, but it was like the most frightening thing I'd ever been through. I, I just didn't know how to talk about it. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And it was like I wasn't supposed to. It was just like God, I couldn't find a person to say, can I just tell you what's going on in my life? There, I couldn't find a person. I just walked through this. And let me tell you what happened. One day I was out on a bike ride and I was listening to some stuff. And I, I thought, you know, I don't, I, I sometimes just like to listen to a podcast or something. And I, and I just had this desire to listen to a friend of mine named Steve May. Steve was a pastor in uh, South LA, pastor of a large church there. And, um, and he died. Good friend, pastor. He and I uh, actually met at of all places at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Had the same problem, so we kind of walked together and became good friends. And he'd come here to church, and and uh, but I just wanted to hear his voice. I hadn't listened to him since he died. I couldn't. I, I just couldn't handle listening to him after he died. I just I thought I can't. I don't want to go through the grief of that. But I felt like the Lord said, "This, this, you got to listen to this." And there, I had one sermon of his on my, on my phone. And it was about not being ashamed of the gospel. And I thought, well, okay, you know, an evangelistic kind of sermon, that's great. You know, I started listening. And it wasn't that at all. He started preaching on 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I thought, well, I'm not sure about the sound mind part. I'm not sure I have that right now. But, but I listened to this message, and he talked about, he traveled a lot. But he talked about going to Africa, to a city, right after 9-11. And he was going to speak at a crusade with the church. And, and listen, I, uh, I listened to him. I was riding around on my bike. I remember the place this happened to. I remember where this whole thing started, where it stopped. But I remember this. I remember he started talking about 
He said, I, I got into my hotel room, I looked down, and he said, I realized they'd already told me I'm the only white person in the city. So I kind of stick out. And I looked down at the bottom of my hotel room, and it's like half the city was there standing under my hotel room window. And he said, I just became convinced I'm going to die. I'm going to die. He said, I especially became convinced when the guys that I'd come in with came up and brought black shoe polish to my hotel room and said, put this on your face. We're going to have to use this to get you out of the room. He said, I knew. He said, I was just praying, Lord, just make me black. Just, you know, help me be black. I, I don't. But he said, this fear was so real. And he went through it for several months. I thought, what in the world? But I'll tell you this, and I'm going to shorten this up. When I got done listening to him talk about this, and he said, you know, the Lord told me, I let you go through this to surface these things in your life that you weren't dealing with and you didn't know were there. And when he said that, it was like a switch came on. And the light came back on in my life. I can't explain it. But what I've come to understand is what I had gone through in that season is spiritual warfare. I should have known that. I'm a pastor. I've been a poor pastor 40 years. I should have figured that out. But I didn't think about that being the case. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you right now are maybe walking through the worst season of your life. The worst season of your life. And you don't know why you're going through this. And the serpent is just wrapped around your neck right now. Listen to me. You pick up the shield of faith. You hold that shield. You trust the Lord in the midst of the trial. And he'll get you through it. He'll get you through it. I don't know who needs to hear that today. I don't know where you are. But I'll tell you this. I'm going to be down front. And if you need to talk, if you want to pray, I will be more than happy to meet with you down here. But listen, don't walk out of here thinking that you're alone because you're not. Thinking that you're hopeless because you're not. Thinking that your circumstances won't change because they will. But sometimes we just have to stand and hold the shield as the enemy pounds on us. And he will. And that's okay. You haven't done anything wrong. You haven't done anything wrong. But the closer you get to God, the attacks will come. And you need to be ready to defend yourself when they do. Let me pray with us. Father, as we close today, <coughs> as we come to this time of commitment and of really coming to terms with some stuff in our lives. I know that there are folks here that are struggling in ways that they, they can't explain. They don't know why they're going through it. They don't understand it. They're calling out to you. They're not, they're not hearing from you. Father, I'm so grateful that you never let us go, that you never put us in a circumstance where we cannot sense your presence and know your touch. And Father, I pray that if, that if we are in that place of difficulty today, maybe it's fear, maybe it's doubt, maybe it's just a relentless temptation or an addiction, a mental health issue or depression. Father, I know the enemy will attack us in many, many ways. But the shield of faith as we stand below it and under it and, 
as we stand in our faith, Lord. We know that the arrows that the enemy sends our way will be extinguished and we will press through. So I pray for our brothers and sisters who may be in battle today. May you help them and may you give us grace to stand together with them through this time. Friend, listen to me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, if, you don't, if you've never trusted him, never believed, that we want to talk to you about how to do that today. And I'd like to ask you to come down front while we're singing right now. And let us talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. If you have trusted him, you just have some need for prayer in your life right now, then come on down front. Let us pray with you. Let us walk with you through that. Don't do this alone. And folks, listen. There's a real enemy. But that's not the end of the story. There's a real Savior. And Jesus Christ is Lord over the enemy, over your life. And if you believe that today, come and confess that. Have your way, Lord pray in Jesus name. Let's stand together folks. You come as God leads you.